Okay, so welcome to the Deliverance and Demonology Workshop, and this is number two in a series, and it's entitled, Can a Christian Be Demonized? That's mm -hmm. controversial, it shouldn't be, but we're going to unpack that tonight. So to my left, you'll see a painting. This is entitled, The Torment of St. Anthony, and this was painted by Michelangelo in 1487 or 1488. This was his very first work, and the subject there is... St. Anthony, who was a desert father. He was a hermit, and he engaged in ascetic <laughs> practices, and um, apparently he wrestled with a lot of demons, so he's sort of a perfect subject for tonight's discussion. And a lot of Renaissance painters were very much um, captured by him. Lots of different painters painted different versions of St. Anthony, so there's that. So, can a Christian be demonized? Well, we have to first correct a common misunderstanding, and that is based on the Old King James translation of the Greek word daimonitsomai. Remember, the Old King James translation came out in 1611. This is a long time ago. And the way that Bible, which is a standard Bible, translates daimonitsomai is demon-possessed. And that implies total ownership. So that word is better translated, daimonitsamai is better translated as demonized, which means that a person has a demon or is under the influence or power of a demon but is not owned by a demon. Very important distinction. So it's a little bit like having the bug, you know, some kind of bug or a fit or a spell, only far worse. But obviously uh -huh. in the case of a believer, the believer belongs to Christ. And uh, actually, all things belong to Jesus, but not everybody recognizes or acknowledges that. Hebrews 1, chapter 1, verse 2 says, Jesus Christ is the appointed heir and the lawful owner of all things. And in the Old Testament, God Most High is described as maker and possessor of heaven and earth. So if you make something, if you author it, then you are necessarily the owner. But of course the devil trespasses on God's property, right? He vandalizes and he squats. And that's why we have this predicament. So despite um, commitment to follow Jesus, a believer can come under the influence of Satan. And let me give you a great example, Peter. Peter, we consider him to be a leader of the early church, a great spokesperson. He was a very good oral communicator. But Jesus rebuked Peter to his face and said, get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me. You're a stumbling block because you do not have in mind the things of God but the things of men. And that's in Matthew chapter 16, verse 23. And the only other time that uh, Jesus said, get behind me, Satan, was when he was addressing Satan himself. Mm. So if Peter, who was considered the head of the church um, by some, maybe even Catholics in particular, if he could come under the influence of Satan, then any one of us can and any one of us could come under the influence of a subordinate of Satan, like, de like a demon or a fallen angel. So, why does the church think that demonization or deliverance is such a strange thing? At least a third of Jesus' ministry was dedicated to exorcism. And I've got a question for you. Out of whom did Jesus primarily cast out demons? Was it um, the pagans? you know, the unbelieving world, or was it primarily the Israelites, the people who were in covenant with God? Israelites. Israelites. Yes. Yes, indeed. And in fact, you were going to add to that? And Gentiles. And Gentiles, but primarily Israelites. At the beginning of his ministry, when a Canaanite woman um, from the pagan region of Tyre and Sidon, this is kind of a coastal area, came to him, she, she begged him to deliver her daughter from a tormenting spirit. And at first he refused. He said this, I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. That's in Matthew chapter 15, verse 24. And the Amplified translation renders this statement as, I was commissioned by God and sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. So salvation is of the Jews, and apparently the Jews have the first right of refusal. Um, so 
it was only by her great faith that she prevailed upon Jesus and got him to just temporarily redirect his ministry, which was supposed to be focused on the Israelites. He temporarily redirected it to this Gentile woman and her Gentile daughter. So the order of priority was and remains God's people first in terms of deliverance. He ministered first and foremost in synagogues and the temple at Jerusalem where the faithful gathered. He said, I always taught in synagogues and in the temple where the Jews always meet, and in secret I have said nothing. That's John chapter 18, verse 20. So the modern equivalent would be Jesus touring all of the churches in America and catapulting demons out of congregation members, and not just laity, but clergy also. Hmm. So he would not primarily go to uh, you know, do deliverance in covens, or crack dens, or strip clubs, or drag queen shows, or valet tuto, anything goes, cage fights. He would go to the river room first, <laughs> right? And he wouldn't, uh, he wouldn't do deliverance first in labs of scientists who concoct new and improved methods of infecting the public with lethal viruses, mm. or labs of pharmacists who roll out new nostrums to undermine public health and fertility and to ensure that the survivors are forever dependent on the malpractice of medicine? No, he would go to churches first. And he would not even go to congressional committees that caucus at the witching hour to misappropriate uncontested trillions. This happened recently in Congress. Or forums of global elites who contrive ways to divest the world population of money and to convert the human race into automatons programmed to perform on demand, he would go instead to churches first. So deliverance begins in the house of God. Oh, well, let me, let me back up. So I had mentioned earlier that Michelangelo, this was his first work, and he actually copied another artist. And, that, and the artist was Martin Schongauer, who did a sketch. I don't know, it's kind of a lot lighter of the same exact thing. So when, when Michelangelo was beginning his career, he was first springboarding off of other people's work. This is St. Anthony tormented by demons. As I said, Martin Schongauer is the painter. Let me give you an example from scripture of Jesus' deliverance ministry. And they went into Capernaum, and immediately on the Sabbath, he entered the synagogue and was teaching. And they were astonished at his teaching, for he taught them as one who had authority and not as the scribes. And immediately there was in their synagogue a man with an unclean spirit, and he cried out, What have you to do with us, Jesus of Nazareth? Have you come to destroy us? I know who you are, the Holy One of God. But Jesus rebuked him, saying, Be silent and come out of him. And the unclean spirit convulsing him and crying out with a loud voice came out of him. And they were all amazed, so that they questioned among themselves, saying, What is this? A new teaching with authority. He commands even the unclean spirits, and they obey him. And at once his fame spread everywhere throughout all the surrounding region of Galilee. That's Mark chapter 1, verses 21 through 28, ESV. That's the English Standard Version. I'll be reading primarily from that one. I want to point out a couple things. Notice the plural form of self-identification used by the demon. It said, what have you to do with us? This was one, one demon speaking, but it was representing a group. And that's typically the case with people. When they're demonized, there's usually more than one. They tend to operate in gangs. That's what Derek Prince said. Mm. Also, notice the worried admission of the demon. Have you come to destroy us? That indicates that Jesus in us is capable of destroying demons. So, back to our uh, discussion about Jesus ministering primarily to Jews. He, he uh, delivered in synagogues. This was a general practice for him. He was preaching in their synagogues throughout all Galilee and casting out demons. So synagogues are generally filled with Jews. They're not filled with Greeks. There are some Greek believers, but... Synagogues are filled with Jews. So he would walk a circuit throughout all the cities of Galilee doing healing and deliverance. And uh, he did this not just in the synagogues, but also in open spaces. 
And here are two reports of his ministry. He went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom and healing every disease and every affliction among the people. So his fame spread throughout all Syria, and they brought him all the sick, those afflicted with various diseases and pains, those oppressed by demons, those having seizures and paralytics, and he healed them. Matthew chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. And here's another one. That evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick or oppressed by demons. And the whole city gathered together at the door. This was the door of Simon Peter. Jesus had just rebuked a fever uh, in, his, in Peter's mother-in-law. And that fever lifted off of her, and she was able to then engage in hospitality. And I believe that was actually a demon that caused that, because normally you rebuke a person. You don't rebuke something that doesn't have any intelligence. So I don't think he was rebuking a pathogen. I think he was rebuking a disembodied evil spirit that was afflicting her. So he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out many demons. And he would not permit the demons to speak because they knew him. Mark chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, ESV again. Luke reports that same account, and he says, Demons also came out of many, crying, You are the Son of God. But he rebuked them and would not allow them to speak, because they knew he was the Christ. So this is Luke chapter 4, verses 40 through 41, ESV. Now let me pause a second. Why do you suppose that he did not permit the demons to testify that he is the Son of God? I mean, that's a fact. That's true. Why would he forbid them to so share he that? Knew he had to die on the cross. What does that have to do with um, forbidding the demons to to? He wanted people because to know that he was the Messiah. So there, here the demons are saying, "This is the Messiah. This is the Son of God." Well, he didn't. Want, he, he didn't want all of the people to know that he was the Messiah. Well, that's true. Not the ones that were going to persecute yeah. him and, and hang him on the cross. So. Yeah, that, that's true, because that would restrict his, um, his ministry um, when he was doing it. Uh, let, me vent, let me venture to offer two um, suggestions. One of them is that um, demons have zero credibility as witnesses, right? They are lying spirits, and they do what their, what their master does. He's the father of all lies. So because they're untrustworthy, um, I, I believe that Jesus did not respect their testimony and he would not accept it regarding his own identity as savior of the world. Another reason uh, for, to forbid demons to speak is because um, allowing them to speak gives them a measure of control, mm -hmm. and they can use that control to misdirect ministry, and I myself have observed this. Let me share with you something that I observed years and years ago when I was a newbie Christian. I was invited to join an ad hoc deliverance um, session, with a man, the recipient was a man who had some kind of demon of psychology or psychiatry. Now please hear, I'm not telling you that psychology or psychiatry are demonic, on the contrary. But I'm just saying that this demon vaunted psychological theories. And the man often channeled this spirit through automatic writing. So he would, he would take um, dictation of lectures from this spirit. Imagine that. He would, he would hear lectures. He would hear this demon lecturing to him, and he would take dictation, and then, uh, and then he would share that with other people. Well, at this round table, he began sharing the content of some of these lectures. And I saw everybody start to lean in, and they were fascinated, and they looked kind of hypnotized. And I said, oh, wait a minute, time out. We're not going to become a captive audience to this agent of hell. So I interrupted the flow. And that I can promise you that that demon would have had people um, enraptured in due course. So demons usually do not like to be exposed. But when they are exposed, they will showcase. They will limelight. And um, sometimes it's better to shut them down. And you have to forbid them to speak. <coughs> All right. Back to Jesus' ministry to the Jews. Um, toward the end of his ministry, and this was during the Passover feast, this was like one week before his crucifixion, some Greeks told Philip, who was a disciple of Jesus, Sir, we wish to see Jesus. 
Now John made a point of announcing that now the Greeks were starting to seek him too. This is at the tail end of his ministry, about three years in, just before he goes to the cross. So this observation, again, reflects that the crowds that followed Jesus or the crowds to, to whom he ministered were primarily Jews. Jesus was casting demons out of his people in worship centers, in the temple, and even out in the open. Not behind closed doors, although we do like the privacy at times. All right, let's take a look at a good example. This painting is entitled The Woman with an Infirmity of 18 Years, and it's by James Tissot. He is a Jewish and French painter. I was just wondering if you should go in a different chair so that you can see the... Me? Why don't you switch chairs? No, not you. She's, she's having to look around my... Um, there you go. <laughs> You'll have a better experience rather than having to, move to duck here. All right, this was blocking her view. All right, so one of the clearest examples of a believer, a believer in God, in the living God, receiving deliverance, is the woman in the synagogue, featured here, who was doubled over by a crippling spirit. She couldn't even stand up or look up for 18 years. Can you imagine? Oh. So let me read to you about this. Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the Sabbath, and behold, there was a woman who had had a disabling spirit for 18 years. She was bent over and could not fully straighten herself. When Jesus saw her, he called her over and said to her, Woman, you are freed from your disability. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight, and she glorified God. But the ruler of the synagogue indignant because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, said to the people, there are six days in which work ought to be done. Come on those days and be healed and not on the Sabbath. Then the Lord answered him, you hypocrites, does not each of you on the Sabbath untie his ox or his donkey from the manger and lead it away to water it? And ought not this woman, a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan bound for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath. And as he said these things, all his adversaries were put to shame, and all the people rejoiced at all the glorious things that were done by him. Luke chapter 13, verses 10 through 17, ESV. So, Jesus called this woman a daughter of Abraham. And this title, Daughter of Abraham, is very significant. It means that not only is she a physical descendant of Abraham, but she is also spiritual offspring of Abraham. So she had faith in the living God, just as Abraham did. She was in covenant with the living God, just as Abraham was. She was in right standing with God, just as Abraham was. She was a friend of God, and also one in whom God could confide just like Abraham, and yet this godly woman had a demon. So this does a lot to help us understand how Christians can have demons. All right, another example of a believer receiving deliverance is Mary Magdalene, out of whom Jesus cast seven demons. And this is uh, entitled, this work of art, Magdalene with the Smoking Flame by Georges de la Tour, and this is in the Louvre in Paris, France. Beautiful, um, beautiful work. 1642, 1644 is the, is the approximate date of the creation of this work. So she was a true follower of Christ, um, though her reputation has been much sullied by Pope Gregory I, who misrepresented her as a prostitute. He actually conflated Mary Magdalene with Mary of Bethany, and also with another woman who is uh, unnamed in the scripture. She's the sinner who repents, who actually weeps and sheds her tears on Jesus' feet and then dries his um, feet with her hair and then kisses his feet and anoints his feet with oil. Well, Pope Gregory confused Mary Magdalene with these two other women who had repented of harlotry. Um, but here are biblical facts about her. She was among the women who followed Jesus and ministered to his needs out of their own substance. And she was also among those who were eyewitnesses of his crucifixion. So she saw the soldiers distribute his garments. She saw them cast lots for his tunic. 
She observed the manner of his death, and she was also a witness to all these cataclysmic events that occurred right after his death. Let me read to you. And the earth shook, and the rocks were split. The tombs also were opened, and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. When the centurion and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe, and they said, Truly, this was the Son of God. There were also many women there, looking on from a distance, who had followed Jesus from Galilee, ministering to him, among whom were Mary Magdalene and others. Matthew chapter 27, verses 51 through 56, ESV. Here's another painting by the same painter. He painted three different paintings. They're very mood, they're mood pieces, aren't they? Um, this is called The Repentant Magdalene, painted in 1635 or 1640, again by Georges de la Tour. This one happens to be in the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Well, that title, The Repentant Magdalene, um, shows that he was influenced by Pope Gregory's confusion about her being a prostitute. All right. Mary Magdalene was one of several women who purchased spices and prepared them and carried them to the tomb at dawn to embalm Jesus according to the Jewish burial rites. And she and the other women were startled to see an angel, or angels, depending on which um, gospel you read, who announced that Jesus had been raised from the dead and then instructed them to share that news with his disciples. So let me read to you a passage. And at the very end, it's got um, something very, a very um, distinguished fact about Mary Magdalene. When the Sabbath was passed, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back, and it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a, in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, Do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He's not here. See the place where they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. Now, when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, from whom he had cast out seven demons. She went and told those who had been with him and as they mourned and wept. But when they heard that he was alive and had been seen by her, they would not believe it. Mark chapter 16, verses 9 through 11, ESV. So Mark reports that an angel charged all of the women who were present in the tomb to share the good news. Um, but apparently, a few of them were freaked out. I mean, they were really in shock and were frightened and did not do it. And Mary Magdalene was the one who followed through. Here is the last of the series uh, by Georges de la Tour. This is entitled The Penitent Magdalene, alternatively also titled Magdalene with Two Flames, because you've got that reflection there. This one's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. I want to say something if I can just digress into art. <laughs> if you study um, this one, um, to me, this looks like an earlier work of his. It almost looks like he was emulating another painter by the name of Caravaggio, who was um, more, had a more Baroque style. Um, this looks more porcelain to me. She's got kind of an artificial perfection about her. His later work looks more soft, more subdued, more realistic, more natural. Just a comment on, on the art. All right, so John reports the same event, but with more details. And it, it, he includes this kind of surreal interaction that Mary has with the two angels and then also with the risen Jesus while she's still in this uh, delirious state of grief. But Mary stood weeping outside the tomb, 
And as she wept, she stooped to look into the tomb. And she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had laid, one at the head and one at the feet. They said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, They've taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Having said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing, but she did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have taken him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my Father and to your Father, to my God and to your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord, and that he had said these things to her. That's John chapter 20, verses 11 through 18, ESV again. So Jesus bestowed on Mary Magdalene this distinct honor of being the first person to interact with him after his death and to report the miracle of his resurrection. She was the first to declare Christ is risen and is ascended to the right hand of the Father. So to me, this elevates the status of women, for one thing. It also affirms their capacity to preach the gospel, because she was the first person who did it. That's the gospel in a nutshell. He's risen, he's ascended to the right hand of the Father, right? And then, and, and it also, this is the profound thing. It, to me, it offsets any type of stigma associated with being demonized, because she was dignified by being this message bearer of a, of a great, great message. So God chose Mary Magdalene, the one who was publicly known as the person out of whom Jesus cast seven demons. No one else is known in that way. All right. The fact is, deliverance is especially for the people of God. And Jesus referred to deliverance as the children's bread. And you can read about that in Matthew chapter 15, verse 26. So that, that term, the children's bread, is very significant. The word children indicates that the intended, res, intended recipients are members of God's household, even you know, dependent, vulnerable members of God's household. And the word bread indicates that deliverance is a vital necessity. It is sustenance. It's life support for those who receive it. R remember that Jesus called himself the bread of life. And now he's referring to deliverance ministry as the children's bread. So that's very honoring. Now, some Christians would ask this question, isn't a Christian fully delivered at salvation? That's a, that's a good question, because it's a theological issue, right? Some, some Christians do believe this, and they, they believe that a person is totally set free from the devil and any kind of demonic influence or attachment at salvation. Well. You know, in one sense this is true, but in another it's not true. Right? We are free, we're set free at salvation, but we have to walk it out. Amen. Freedom in Christ is a positional truth. So it may not be fully experienced by a believer right off the bat. Just like a legal right may not be operational until you go into a court of law and get it operational. So Christ's defeat of the devil is final but most of us don't appropriate that victory instantly. We have a measure of freedom when we get saved, but we have to contend for the rest. And now we're going to take an example. Living, well, to me, he's still alive, and he is. He's, he's probably observing us in the cloud of witnesses right now. So this is a, a, a picture of Derek Prince. He lived from 1915 to 2003. He was a very highly respected uh, Bible expositor who had a global ministry. And he started out as a Cambridge University scholar, so you can imagine he was quite a brilliant intellect. He became a medic in the British Army in World War II and got saved. But um, after he accepted Christ, he admitted that he was still beleaguered by a number of things. One is that he had a compulsion to curse. He couldn't help himself. He had a compulsion to use profanity. So he fit right in with the military there. 
Um, and then he had this daily self-medicating habit of drinking whiskey, which happened to be a family vice. He was introduced to this by his own family. Probably had a generational demon of um, whiskey addiction. And then he also said that he felt this power from below, which he later identified as the demon of yoga. He was a yoga practitioner before it even became vogue. We're talking, you know, when it was still considered fringe. Um, and he had also this dark cloud of depression settle on him from time to time. And he had entered into this kind of brooding state. So this was his condition after he was saved for some time. And then it, it wasn't until he had a supernatural experience in the Holy Spirit. This was the baptism in the Holy Spirit where he got the gift of tongues. He felt this power from on high descending on him like a cascade. And then he felt this tremendous power flush and like a lot of debris and filthiness was exiting his body. And then after that, he was instantly free of profanity, whiskey, and the power from below that yoga demon. I mean, like instantly. So it was, he didn't even go through a deliverance. It was the power of God sovereignly delivering him. Even then, he still had this demon of depression for years and years. And as he pondered this, one day he was reading in Isaiah chapter 61, verse 3, and he saw a verse there that describes the spirit of heaviness. And he said, that's it. That is my problem. It's not a psychological condition. It's not something that I have to like discipline myself to, you know, to control. This is an enemy alien in me, and I'm getting it out. So he also realized that this spirit of depression had stalked the male members of his family. Uh, all, pr practically all the male members of his family had this brooding spirit of depression come over them from time to time. So you see there from his example that freedom in Christ came gradually. It came progressively. And it was punctuated by these periodic dramatic breakthroughs. But by and by, um, his experience I think is highly representative of that of most Christians, which is that um, this is a sanctification process. We're becoming freer and freer. We're becoming more and more pure, more and more set apart unto God. All right. One, let's, let's think, consider the opposition, though. One scripture that Christians cite in support of total freedom from the power of darkness at salvation is 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 17 through 18. So I want to examine this verse really closely because it has led to this mistaken impression that no Christian needs deliverance after salvation, or no Christian should need deliverance after salvation. Now I'm going to read to you several translations. This refers to the new creation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. That's the New King James. Here's another translation. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old has gone, the new is here. New International Version. And here's another one. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, that is, grafted in, joined to him by faith in him as Savior, he is a new creature, reborn and renewed by the Holy Spirit. The old things, the previous moral and spiritual condition have passed away. Behold, new things have come because spiritual awakening brings new life. That's the Amplified. So all of these translations give the impression that the new creation is finished and complete, fixed and final upon salvation. And, and I would say that even the, the New International Version is probably the most emphatic in this presentation of a fully materialized reality. The old has gone. It says the old is gone, the new is here. Well, this interpretation is misleading, and it is a result of the way that the original verb form has been modernized and lost its original meaning, which includes a time reference. It's also the, the result of, I would say, the translator's interpretation. So together these things have contributed to this misunderstanding that the new creation has replaced the old and that deliverance is perfected at the moment of salvation. That's the mistake. Now because this is such a, a, you know, a crucial issue, whether deliverance 
concludes at salvation or whether it begins and continues, it's worth researching this verb. And uh, the, uh, our theology hinges on it. I met someone in, in um, Scotland who believed this way because of this particular verse. All right, so let me just let, uh, do a little retro here. I used to be a, a college English instructor, and I just want to give you a little bit of a lesson here on this word. All right, so this action word that describes the new creation is the verb ginomai, and it means, literally, to become, to come into existence, to begin to be, to receive being. And the archaic form of the verb was rendered is become or are become, as in all things are become new. Well, this archaic form is not used in any of the modern translations that I read to you, probably because it sounds a bit awkward and contrived in modern English. In fact, it was outmoded in Middle English, and it was replaced by has become or have become. So modern English only uses this archaic form for poetic purposes, or for a specific narrow application involving a direct object, which we don't need to learn about. <laughs> Examples of the archaic form are in the old King James Version of the Bible, the 1611 version. Let me give you a couple examples. The Lord is my strength and my fortress and my song. He is become my salvation. The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdom of our Lord. Another example of the archaic and poetic usage of this verb was made famous by a man named Oppenheimer. He was the father of the atomic bomb. And he rendered a verse from the Bhagavad Gita, which is a Hindu sacred text, as, now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. Sounds like a slogan for a gaming system. <laughs> now I am become death, destroyer of worlds. <laughs> anyway, you can see that that's very, um, you know, it's got a poetic <laughs> usage. You like that, don't you? <laughs> All right, so the problem with substituting the modern verb has become in the place of the archaic verb is become is this subtle but important difference in meaning. And it, it, this is illustrated beautifully in this sculpture here. The Freedom Sculpture, this is by Zenos Frudakis, and it was completed in 2001. So take a look at that while I, while I explain, while I compare and contrast. So the archaic verb expresses motion and transition, like these figures in that sculpture. You see this, the figures are emerging from the wall, and they're, one of them is running forward. That's what the archaic verb expresses, motion, transition, shift, metamorphosis, um, it's, a, it's a dynamic verb form. It implies ongoing action and an unfolding process of development. By contrast, the modern verb suggests something stable and static, like a completed action or a, you know, a state of being that has already been attained. So the di this difference in connotation changes the entire meaning of the verse. Let's take a look at a detail. That's the Freedom Sculpture again by Zenos Frudakis. So the modern translations use what, they, what is called in English the present perfect tense, has become or have become. This refers to an action or an event that takes place in both the past and also the present. Now the problem is most people don't interpret it that way because they haven't memorized English grammar rules. Why should we? I can say that, having been a former gra grammar Nazi. So most people interpret has become or have become um, as kind of a change, change in identity that was completed in the past. For example, let me give you an example. If I say she has become rich with investments, then you know she's rich, period, end of story. No more to tell. And if I say to you that they have become healthy through exercise, then they're healthy, you know? Period. End of story. No more to tell. So they don't, the problem is that this is supposed to describe a process of development. You know, she's becoming richer and richer, they're becoming healthier and healthier, more and more fit. Um, and it's like, also, this particular sculpture by Michelangelo. You see the figure is emerging, but it's not completely emerged. It's in the process of emerging. 
This is called Atlas Slave, and it is an unfinished sculpture by Michelangelo. And it, it perfectly describes this verb, to become, to come into existence, to begin to be, to receive being. Speaking of this process of the development. Now, when you apply that to the new creation, this means that the new creation is both now and not yet. Just like the kingdom is both now and not yet. Yes, we are set free at salvation, but we're getting freer all the time, especially as we cooperate with the Holy Spirit, because it's our Father's good pleasure to give us the kingdom. But the kingdom of heaven suffers violence, and the violent take it by force. So you have this interesting tension between something that is already occurring, but is yet to unfold even more. All right, the Apostle Paul affirms this too, and I'd like to read what he says. He talks about salvation as being a process. Yes, there was a finished transaction, but we continue to be saved. Not that I have already attained, or am already perfected, or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on that I may take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not count myself to have apprehended or taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and reaching forward and straining to what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Philippians chapter 3, verses 12 through 14. And that's a combination uh, of the New International Version and the New King James Version. I kind of jammed them together. Well, so... Since deliverance is part of salvation, and salvation is a process, that means that deliverance is a process. It's not a one-time event, but we might have these landmark events on a time continuum. Now, this is where it gets tricky and where some people start to get squeamish. How can the Holy Spirit in a Christian share space with a demon? How can the Holy Spirit in a Christian share space with a demon? <laughs> <laughs> a lot of people feel that way, right? Well, he, he does for our sake, and that is the unfathomable love of God. The Holy Spirit enters us to make us holy, not because we are holy. I mean, what condition are we in? Are we perfect? Do we give place to the devil? We're a child of God. Yes, but sometimes we, we act like we're a child of the devil. I mean, we don't, we're not always acting like we're a child of God. So when we get saved, we're not instantly transformed into Christ-like nature. Only gradually, as we continue to cooperate with him and be, be disciplined by him. We all still sin, and we all have to work out our own salvation with fear and trembling. John says in his first epistle, If we say we have no sin, we delude and lead ourselves astray, and the truth is not in us. 1 John chapter 1, verse 8. That's the Amplified. So when the Holy Spirit shares space with sinners, he necessarily also shares space with the devil because we give place to the devil. We yield to him. However, the Holy Spirit is in us, abides in us, to give us power over the devil and to disturb the devil and to drive him out. That's the whole beauty of it. So, but our sin still can attract demons, and especially if it's habitual sin or a type of generational sin, maybe a, a particular uh, proclivity toward a, a, you know, brokenness or crookedness that's in the family line. Now, sin, when it is full grown, brings forth death, Romans chapter 5, verse 12, and it attracts this. Mm. So demons are like raptors. This is a vulture, quite a creature, don't you think? Very impressive. Um, these are predatory birds that prey on the corrupt, carnal nature. And do you know, Revelation actually refers to demons as unclean birds. Uh, chapter 18, verse 2, unclean birds. Jesus alludes to this also in a passage about the end times. He says, wherever the rotting carcass is, there the carrion vultures gather. Matthew chapter 24, verse 28, that's the NIV. So let's think about what Jesus was saying. He often spoke in parables. It wasn't a big news flash to desert dwellers that, you know, when you have a carcass, there the raptors are. There, there, the, you know, there the vultures gather. So he must have been speaking about spiritual matters 
Because that you wouldn't tell desert dwellers who already know that fact, that, you know, that this is some kind of brilliant disclosure. He, he was referring to spiritual matters. Basically, the carnal nature attracts demons the way that rotting flesh attracts raptors. That's what he was saying. And after all, Satan is the prince of the power of the air, and his agents and emissaries are aerial predators. Now, deliverance, I would say, is probably the greatest aspect of the redemptive work of the cross. And this is a painting entitled The Brazen Serpent by James Tissot, and it was painted sometime between 1896 and 1902. It's in the Jewish mu Museum. So Jesus said, as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. John chapter 3, verses 14 and 15. That's the New King James. Now, Jesus was referring to a very peculiar incident in the wilderness, and this prefigured his crucifixion. This was foreshadowing his crucifixion. And just to make a long story short, and you can find this in the book of Numbers, the Israelites got very frustrated in the wilderness, as we all would, and they blamed God, and they slandered God, and then they were bit by fiery flying serpents for their backbiting. Kind of a poetic judgment on them. Well, the Lord provided this um, unusual antidote to the snake bites. He instructed Moses to build a bronze sculpture of a snake on a stake or a serpent on a pole. And he instructed him to lift it up and to have all the Israelites gaze at this steadily. And miraculously, they were healed. Now, there was nothing about the sculpture that had the power. It was just prefiguring or foreshadowing Christ's crucifixion. So the snake on a stake um, shows the impact of the crucifixion on Satan. Think about this. Okay, so Jesus identified with our humanity, and our humanity had gotten hopelessly intertwined with the serpent nature. And it had become deformed and subhuman, which is why Jesus was brutally beaten to the point where he was not even recognizable as human. So Jesus fastened this sin nature and this snake nature to the stake through his own body. And there, thereby he suffered the judgment that was due to man for getting entangled with Satan. Usually when we look at the cross, we think of um, you know, Jesus diff basically ending or terminating the carnal nature. But this is mu as much an end or termination of the snake nature. And of this redemptive work, Jesus said, Now the ruler, the evil genius, the prince of this world, shall be cast out and expelled. And I, if, if I am lifted up from the earth on the cross, I will draw and attract all men, all Gentiles, as well as Jews, to myself. John chapter 12, verses 31 through 32, and that's the Amplified. So, since... Satan was cast out and expelled at the cross. So too were all of his agents and all of his emissaries. But we have to enforce it. It doesn't come automatically. Now I want to give you a little bit of a wrap up before we do um, an application. Christians can be demonized. I hope we see that that's the case. Um, and often it can be through sin patterns. Not always, but often. And for most Christians, deliverance is progressive and it has to be pursued. Sometimes people have to fight for it very strenuously. It just depends on the level of demonic attachment. Deliverance is part of the sanctification process of the believer. It's part of being set apart for a sacred purpose and purified and consecrated to the Most High. And I would say that that redemptive purpose is usually the exact opposite of our bondage. So if you think about the type of bondage you had um, God's intent, had or have, God's intent is that you, first of all, get free, and secondly, that you become a freedom fighter in that very area. Our destiny is to take our former captors captive and to deliver captives. That's our destiny. So, basic principles of deliverance. And, you know, you can, 
uh, probably most of you already know this. Forgiveness, repentance, renunciation, expulsion. That's kind of the basic format, if there is a format. There may be other things that you have to do. You might have to break a soul tie. If you've had a one flesh union with someone, you might have to break a generational curse. If you can see that there's a pattern in your family line. But generally speaking, <coughs> forgiveness, repentance, <coughs> renunciation, and expulsion are the, the basics of deliverance. So you have to forgive whoever offended you or trespassed against you, and that could be a lot of people. And then you have to repent of any kind of negative stance that you developed on account of that offense or trespass. So I would like to say that offense is the birthplace of false beliefs. Offense is the birthplace of a wrong mindset about yourself, about others, about God. Um, it's the birthplace of negative perspectives, negative attitudes, wrong speech, wrong behavior. You know, so we have to recognize these things, come out of agreement with them, and then move on. Also, we might need to renounce any type of negative habit or practice or lifestyle that we adopted in order to cope with the offense or to compensate for the offense. And there are lots of different things that we might have adopted. And then ultimately, when we've done all this spiritual housekeeping, then we can command the demon to vacate. All right, that's kind of... Um, that's kind of the um, outline. Just uh, stand up for a second. I want you to um, just repeat after me. We're going to do a short, um, just a short like outline thing here. All right. So I'm going to say a statement, and then you, and then you repeat. Or you feel free to sit too. I, I realize that standing is not for everybody, but I figure some of you want to stretch <laughs> or do laughs. All right. Repeat after me. I forgive blank. I forgive. For A, B, C, D. Okay. Right? I repent of my negative stance. Commit. Forget of my negative feelings and things. P, Q, R, whatever it is. I renounce my negative habits. I renounce my negative habits. X, Y, Z. Whatever they are. I command you, spirit of blank. And you spirit spirit of right. To go to judgment in Jesus. To go to judgment in Jesus. Let's do that last one at least one more time. I command you, spirit of blank, I command you spirit of blank. to go to your judgment in Jesus. One more time. I command you, spirit of blank, to go to your judgment in Jesus. Good. I like that. Okay, I'm going to share one personal example with you um, as a, you can feel free to sit down, unless you want to stand. By the way, don't ever feel like you got to stay plastered <coughs> to the chair. If you want to go in the back and stand or walk around, I'm okay with that. Um, it's A-okay. All right, so during a fast, I felt led to ask the Lord if there was anything blocking my ability to hear the Lord spiritually. Because oftentimes in my own devotional practice, I don't hear him speak that much. I'll, you know, I'll say, I'm listening, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, I'm waiting, and I don't hear much. And so I thought, man, do I have some kind of a block? Immediately, this image flashed in my mind of myself as a young woman, this was in my early 20s, and I was holding a telephone receiver really far away from my body, and on the other end of the line was my mother releasing a tirade against me. You know, uh, a tirade is basically a long harangue of criticism and accusations. Mm -hmm. And the fact is that that was not a unique posture for me. I had actually done that many, many times. I was in the habit of doing that. I avoided conversations with my mother. And um, when I was in them, that's what I would ultimately do. So she was talking into the air. Now, how did I develop such disregard for my mom? Why did I ignore her speech? Well, she was a bit of a domineering person, and she frequently monopolized conversations. I mean, conversations were really unilateral. They were monologues. They were not dialogues. And then often they were kind of negative. So she had this tendency to be overbearing and critical and accusatory, and I, I felt invalidated by that. I felt negated by that. And uh, unfortunately, I internalized those decrees. And this is the sticking point when we have trauma with parents. Uh, instead of 
getting the facts about myself from God, you know, what, who am I, what's my identity, what's my worth, Lord, you know, what's my purpose in life, what is my significance to you, I got them from my mom, and I let her dictate my identity, my worth, my purpose, my significance. So based on her treatment of me, you know, it really did seem to me that she was convinced that what she had to say was more important than what I had to say, and that what I had to say was not important, and therefore, I was not important. So you can imagine I got, I got pretty angry about that, and I retaliated by cutting off communication with her because I didn't want to feel diminished, you know, and I didn't want to be held captive to her, um, her hell, her personal hell. Mm -hmm. So my anger and my defense strategies are understandable, but they were not God's way, right? <laughs> Um, this was a natural reaction to my mom's trespass, but it was a carnal solution to a relational problem, and one that doesn't really work. So obviously one of the Ten Commandments is that you honor your father and your mother. And I was not honoring her, I was just dismissing her outright. Now honoring parents, by the way, does not mean that you accept their abuse. It just means that you're open to, you're open to them as human beings. All right, so Jesus said that we have to forgive, and he said that if we don't forgive, we can be turned over to the torturers or tormentors. He describes this in a parable. Uh, let me read you quickly. Then his master said to him, You wicked servant, I forgave you all that debt because you begged me. Should you not also have had compassion on your fellow servant, just as I had pity on you? And his master was angry and delivered him to the torturers until he should pay all that was due. So my heavenly father also will do, do if each of you from his heart does not forgive his brother his trespasses. Whoa. Mm -hmm. Delivered over the torturers or tormentors. That is a perfect um, description of the demons. Matthew chapter 18 verses 32 through 34. So... I suspected that there was a demon blocking my spiritual hearing, and I also suspected that, that there was a demon blocking my physical hearing, because check this out, deafness runs in my family line on the maternal side, and you know that all the women who were deaf, deaf also happened to be the ones who would not listen to others. Very little correlation there, I wonder, I wonder. So I was like, whoo, I forgive my mom. <laughs> so I forgave my mom for, you know, attacking me verbally, for talking over me all the time. And I repented also of my defense tactics, which were totally useless, and for shutting her down. And then I cast out two demons. One was blocking my spiritual hearing, and I believe that the other could have blocked my physical hearing in the future. So... Parents can imprint on us really powerfully. And what I'd like to do in the application part when um, Shaz is playing some soaking music is to seek the Lord about any type of lingering offense that you may have with a mother or a father. I recommend only taking one and only taking one issue. Usually we, we have issues with both parents and usually there are multiple issues with both parents. But just take one issue with one parent and forgive <laughs> your father or your mother of that <laughs> trespass Repent of any type of counterproductive tendencies that you develop out of that. And then if you think that you've done a good job, cast out a demon that you suspect might be associated with whatever problem you have. It might be, you know, some form of oppression. All right? Do you understand what, what we're going to do here? Shaz is going to come up and play. Go ahead and come up, sweetheart. She's going to give us some um, lovely background music. I talk about it as cascading water. And then I will probably migrate through and speak in tongues, and I might lay a hand on your shoulder. If you don't want me to do that, you can just tell me. That's no problem. Um, and then we'll conclude after that. All right, I think I'll say bye to the YouTube audience. Thank you for joining us.